Officially, I'm fired now. But then again, I spent the last 24 hours or something driving around with my manager. So that really doesn't matter all that much. Dale drove all day and night when we finally pulled over at a rest stop. He told me to stay in the truck and went outside to get himself some coffee. I did as he told me. My seat had gotten all soft and weary, but my butt hurt from not having stood upright for so long. I almost felt like the car was absorbing me. I leaned over to take a look into the rearview mirror. My hair was matted and my eyes bloodshot. Ever since we had fled from the park, I hadn't been able to shake that feeling of my reflection not being my own. Don't get me wrong, it's no one else's. It just isn't mine. It feels like I've distanced myself from it. Dale had told me not to look into the mirror as much. He had said it wasn't dangerous, but that it would do nothing but drive me crazy. Still, I couldn't stop sneaking quick glances at it. Every time I was scared to find something new, something that might have changed about the way I look, but there was nothing there yet. I wondered if that was a good or a bad thing. Dale returned a little later, with a large cup of coffee for himself and a cupcake for me. He handed it to me and squeezed my shoulder, awkwardly trying to comfort me. Figured you could use some carbs, he said softly. I always eat when I'm sad. Not good for my body, but it helps temporarily. Won't I get crumbs on the seat? I muttered warily. I don't care. Make as big as a mess you like. Crumbs aren't vomit, so... His voice trailed off. It's fine, is what I'm saying. He took a sip of his coffee. I carefully unwrapped the cupcake and took a good chunk out of it. It was soft and sweet. There was pink strawberry cream inside and white chocolate on top. The two sugary flavors mixed on my tongue, banishing the foul taste of worn saliva. Thank you, I whispered, but my voice broke again. I quickly took another bite of the cupcake, then another, then stuffed the whole thing into my mouth. Dale regarded me quietly from the driver's seat. The look in his eyes was unfathomable as can be, but I believed to recognize genuine sorrow somewhere within. I think you should try to sleep a little. I can't rest like this, Dale. Please, tell me what's going to happen to me, or where you're taking me, or anything at all. The blond man let out a soft sigh as he leaned back in his seat. If it puts your mind at ease, be my guest but maybe I should start at the beginning. What do you think? The beginning? I repeated questioningly. Dale nodded. The very beginning. How the park came to be in the first place. Would you like to hear that? His voice was incredibly soft and gentle. Even on his friendlier days, I had never heard him speak like that. He was talking to me like a father would to his frightened child. Yes, I breathed, curling up in my seat. Well then, Think of it as a bedtime story. That's how it was taught to me. My mother and father were always very eager to prepare me for the kind of life I would be leading. Me and my siblings too, of course. They would come to our beds every night, and just before letting us go to sleep, they would tell us the story. The same one over and over again. It burned itself into our young minds. It shaped us. Made us wary of what was to come once we would become grown-ups. Sometime during the late 1800s, my family's ancestors decided to settle down on a patch of land. They hailed from, well, basically everywhere. Some of them came from Texas, others from further up north. But they all gathered to mend their bond as distant relatives, because they wanted to make money. That might have not been the most honorable goal, but at the time, none of them were wealthy, not by any stretch of the word. They figured that maybe if they would all join forces, they could build up something. A brand, perhaps. I'm not sure what it was they had in mind exactly. Either way, it took this scattered bunch nearly a full year to get together again. But once they were all reunited, they got on their journey. They settled down on a really large clearing in the middle of a forest. They began by building a single large cottage for them to live in. At first, everything was fine. Things were looking up for them. However, they soon came up with the idea to turn their land into a fairground, since there were many townships in close proximity to the woods. So they started chopping down trees. That's when the nightmare began. The settlers had thought that the woods were not populated, and that they didn't belong to anybody. 
On the paper, they didn't, but the truth looked a bit different. It started with Faith, a younger, at the time pregnant woman, who had been traveling with her husband, who was part of the clan, suffering a miscarriage. When the first tree fell, she went into labor. It was way, way too early. She was bound to her bed for two entire days, screaming and crying in agony, while the men outside continued to clear the forest. Her child never lived to see the light of day. Of course, my ancestors didn't immediately draw the connection. How could they have? They merrily continued to cut down the trees. Just one week after Faith's miscarriage, Lawrence, the six-year-old son of one of the couples, vanished from his bedroom without a trace. The next child to disappear was a girl called Millie, and that's when the family began to catch on. See, Millie was just five when she disappeared, but she had an older half-brother in his early thirties. His name was Colt, and you should probably know that he had a cleft lip. Now, Colt wasn't the type to sit on his ass while his little sister could have been taken God knows where. He was one of those who hailed from Texas, and he was your typical cowboy. He did care a whole lot about manners and etiquette and all that shit. He was a true gentleman. Swearing he would not leave Millie hanging, he set out to look for her. The family told him it was useless. After all, they had already searched the whole woods and the neighboring towns when Lawrence had gone missing. But Colt wouldn't listen. He went for the woods, and he was out there for days. Just when he was about to give up, he found a hole. There was a hole in the ground, right next to an old fallen tree. And on the remains of that tree sat a man dressed in nothing but rags. The man was holding a child, a little girl who seemed to be fast asleep. Colt immediately recognized her. It was Millie. He pulled out his revolver and aimed at the man, and he screamed at him to let her go. But the man just smiled at him and asked him what his name was. For some reason, this question struck Colt as off. He decided not to answer. He approached the man on the fallen tree, warning him once again that if he wouldn't hand over the girl, he would shoot him. The stranger, however, remained unfazed, grinning with black teeth. For the next bit, you need to know that Colt was a bit of a craftsman. He was a firearm fanatic, and due to not always having the money to buy ammunition, yes, they were that poor, he would sometimes try to make his own. These handmade bullets would hardly ever fly far. They were pretty much useless. But Colt insisted that they were better than nothing. He made them from iron, you know. I heard he melted old nails and stuff, but whatever. At the time, there were five bullets in his revolver, two normal ones that were made of lead, and three made of his handmade iron ones. The man on the fallen tree laid Millie down on the ground. She was unconscious, didn't even know what was going on around her. He slowly started to walk towards him. Colt began to shoot at him. He fired two shots at him, both hitting him in the stomach. He stopped for a few seconds, appearing to be in pain. But to Colt's shock and astonishment, he just straightened up again and continued coming closer. The wounds where the bullets had sunken into his flesh had vanished. So Colt fired the remaining three shots in his revolver. The stranger was just close enough for the iron bullets to find their target. He shot him right in the chest three times, but this time the stranger let out a cry of agony and fell to the ground. Colt grabbed his sister and ran back home while her kidnapper was still writhing on the ground. That same night, as soon as the sun had set, a group of the strangest creatures emerged from the tree line. They surrounded the cottage and waited for the family to come out. Colt had told them all about what had happened when he had brought back Millie, and they had prepared themselves for battle. But when they came outside, only the man with the black teeth stepped forward, the one who held the little girl. Even though there were three bullet holes in his chest, he stood upright, and when he spoke, black drool came dripping from his mouth, and in the sharpest of voices, he offered Colt a deal. We started taking your young ones when you began to destroy our home, he told him, but we will return to you. We will even help you with your endeavor to reshape our land. However, we will do so under the one condition that you treat our every wish as your command. Of course, Colt was less than happy with this suggestion, especially since it was so vague. It could mean anything. Still, he struck a bargain with the black-teethed man, but only after they had worked out a certain set of stakes. You may have already guessed most of them. 
The creatures would help the family to gain money. They promised that they would personally see to their success, no matter the changes to the woods this would require. There would only be three of the creatures to stay on the surface. The rest of them would move underground into a certain realm that appeared to be accessible by the hole in the ground where Colt had found the black-teethed one. These three would provide the humans with each of their names, granting them a certain power over them. However, they would demand sacrifices of unspecified nature, which the humans would be bound to provide, but they also assured them that they would use the sacrifices for the refinement of the fairground. Those were the basics, but there was one last oath Colt made them take. He had noticed that during their consultation, the creatures had kept trying to screw them over by using very vague phrases and careful wording. He figured that since it was so dangerous to talk to them, it would be better if they couldn't talk at all. He forbade them from speaking. Only the ones who would stay on top, though, of course. The black-teethed one introduced himself as Warren, and the other two that would stay on the surface as Mulberry and Moth. Nowadays, you know Mulberry as the Sugar Plum Fairy and Moth as the Mime. My folks probably noticed that they had made quite a crappy mistake right away, because right after the contract was sealed, Warren snapped Colt's neck and took on his form. The only thing he couldn't replicate were his white teeth and normal saliva. But I guess he didn't really need to, since he... Well, I guess you know what he uses it for. The three holes in his chest from the iron bullets stayed as well. Dale ended the report with a soft sigh, and I stared at him incredulously. That all sounded like a fairy tale, I remarked. Well, that's what we've been told. Maybe it happened like this, maybe it didn't. But the important thing is that with the creature's help, the clearing was turned into a fairground. When the time came, it was changed into an amusement park. The one you now know. Every single thing in the park was built by them. Sure, we were able to make additions and renovations to it, but it was them who laid the foundation. Don't ask how they did it. I never quite understood it myself. Either way, the creatures lost their names and ability to speak. But while we gained wealth, we also lost our privilege of freedom. We have to give them what they want, no matter what it is. If we don't, Dale paused to swallow audibly. They will not only tear down the park, but probably come for our young ones again. I held my breath, and Dale continued. Warren, Mulberry, and Moth were tasked with staying on the surface to enforce the contract. But let's be honest here. Warren is the only one who takes it serious. He chose every single one of the sacrifices. Mulberry gained a certain passion for dancing, so she just does that all day. And Moth never cared much about anything. He's more like an animal, I think. Are they... fairies? I asked. That's the thing. We don't know. We believe them to be. But they're not exactly the ones you'll find in literature. They enjoyed mischief and follow certain rules. They even react negatively to most of the same materials. Plus, they're able to change shapes. See, Millie died of some illness in her teen years, and Mulberry took on her outward appearance. I'm not sure how they do it. Maybe they can only change into people who are dead. But there are obvious inconsistencies that set them apart from the traditional fairy folk. My folks, and I, we call them the Wild Ones. The Wild Ones? I repeated. Yeah, that includes those who live underground. My head was spinning. I still had quite a lot of questions, but before I could say anything, Dale went on. We need to focus on Warren, though. He's the park's guardian, the enforcer of the contract. I won't go so far as to say that he's upper management, but he... He communicates with the ones underground. They discuss who or what it is that they want, but in the end, he's the one who'll make me do it. Fun fact, the ones underground, they weren't forbidden from speaking. And sometimes when they want me to, I can hear them. I hate when they do that. Warren is also the one who designs the Halloween tasks. I mean, square dancing and his handler humiliating himself. He uses them to mess with us a little. And most importantly, he's the one who is trying to turn you into a not-actor. I'm sorry if my account just now sounded like a jumbled mess. You don't even need to care about the contract anymore. I've breached it. 
I... I denied war and his sacrifice. I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to know the answer to the question burning on my tongue, but I asked anyways. Why me? How did he... When did he decide? Dale bit his lower lip. He let me know he wanted you last Halloween. But if I'm being honest, you were doomed the moment you walked your happy ass into the park for the first time. It was just the same with Nathan. Even though I think he simply had me do that one because he's never liked me all that much. I still remember it like it was yesterday. He came into my office that one morning. There was a framed photo of Nathan and me standing on my desk. And he took it and looked at it for a little while. I was like, what's going on? What do you want? And he just... He just pointed at him in the photo and grinned. He took the one thing that made me happy. Like, truly happy that day. So, what now? Do we kill him? Dale chuckled. I'm totally on board with your enthusiasm, but I don't know how. That's why I'm taking you to meet my family. Perhaps we can come up with something together. We need to get ourselves out of this mess somehow. The contract's done for. That means Warren might, you know. I just hate to imagine anything happening to them. I still had quite a lot of questions, but I felt like I had heard enough for the day. I curled up in my seat and shut my eyes. I don't know how exactly I managed to fall asleep with the truck driving, but somehow I did. It's kind of strange. I haven't really done anything all day, but I feel terribly exhausted.